I, I think we can start. I uh, inform you that uh, uh, the session is recorded and uh, uh, please uh, uh, switch off uh, the mic and uh, uh, the video if you are uh, not uh, talking. I, but this doesn't help for Leonidas and Santiago. It's nice to watch you in your face while I introduce you. So this is the third uh, of the Cosmos Roundtable this year. Uh, and I'm uh, uh, very glad to have with us uh, Santiago Enria and uh, Leonidas Oikonomakis. I want to say a few words about the series of Cosmos Talk. Uh, and then say why we are so happy to have uh, uh, you participating in this uh, uh, roundtable. So in general, uh, with the Cosmos uh, roundtable, we had the idea of uh, discussing actual events uh, which uh, affect social movements in different parts of the uh, world and to discuss it with uh, uh, authors uh, that can uh, uh, tell us uh, more about the interactions between social movements and other political uh, uh, events. Uh, by, to a certain extent, by chance, we had the first uh, three sessions on uh, uh, North American, Latin American uh, issues and on issues related with the elections, the American elections in which Sita Rose and Ken Roberts participated, one on the Chile referendum and this one on, not exactly on the elections, but uh, uh, on uh, a return of uh, uh, mass uh, in uh, uh, Bolivia after one important uh, uh, electoral moment we, uh, uh, about which we want to see uh, how social movements may, uh, especially progressive social movements, may have uh, uh, intervened. I think it is not by chance that we have these uh, last two talks on Latin America, but it is uh, to a certain extent uh, prompted by the uh, um, ideas that what's happening in Latin America is, is important also because uh, uh, it has been uh, in recent decades uh, uh, sort of ahead of time uh, uh, with regards to what was happening in other uh, regions of the world. So we had uh, a revival of the left, which was very important, following anti-austerity protest uh, uh, that also anticipated what happened, for instance, in, in Southern Europe later on. And uh, not by chance, also several uh, of us has been interested in comparing what's going on in Latin America with what's going on uh, in uh, Southern Europe in particular. Uh, the uh, Bolivian um, experience is particularly uh, important when reflecting between social movements and uh, party politics and institutional politics, uh, also because uh, uh, mass has been uh, the uh, ideal typical uh, social movement parties uh, and uh, the relationship between uh, uh, social movements and party politics uh, has been very relevant, uh, not only at the level of Bolivia, but also Latin America and uh, uh, outside of Latin America. Uh, I'm very glad to have uh, to, tonight with us uh, uh, Santiago Enria and uh, Leonidas Oikonomakis that have studied in depth uh, Bolivian politics uh, and also from uh, uh, different perspectives that can uh, interact well uh, in uh, uh, our meeting. Uh, Santiago is the author of When Movements Become Parties, uh, addressing uh, the Bolivian mass in an historical uh, perspective. It's been published by Cambridge University Press, and it is the book that taught, uh, uh, taught me a lot about Bolivian uh, politics. Uh, uh, Santiago is at the moment in Buenos Aires, but usually is at Dickin Dickinson College uh, uh, in the United States, and is professor of political science and Latin American uh, studies. 
uh, he's been uh, uh, teaching me in particular how, import how important times and space uh, is uh, for uh, thinking about the relationship between parties and social movements. So in a very nuanced and sophisticated analysis, he has looked at the ways different movements have interacted with the parties and how in different times the uh, interactions has developed. So I think that one of the conclusions I draw uh, from the book is also that movement parties is, is not just a temporary thing. So uh, for a parties like mass social movements were important for a long time, uh, but the relationship changed. And uh, the relationship with the cocaleros was different from the relationship with the urban social movements. So uh, an important uh, uh, insight that we are going to discuss uh, 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 later on after I introduce also Leonida Oikonomakis, who uh, is uh, uh, taking a more anthropological type of perspective. Uh, uh, I know him well. Uh, I supervise this thesis at the European University uh, Institute and uh, Leonidas had studied in a comparative perspective uh, uh, the sort of uh, strategies that lead social movement to choose electoral politics or not to choose it. So the two cases, uh, uh, Cocaleros and uh, Zapateras, Zapateros with different uh, uh, perspectives. After having been at the UI uh, in Cosmos, Leonidas has been also uh, a member of Cosmos uh, at Palazzo Strozzi, the Scuola Normale Superiore. He was then uh, also uh, a postdoctoral fellow at Durham uh, and now he uh, uh, teaches at the University of Crete. We hope to have both of you uh, in uh, Florence in person, just wanted to say Leonidas has different lives. So he's uh, a scholar uh, uh, committed to research in particular on Latin America, but he's also a rap singer and he's also the editor and, and editor of Roar uh, magazine. So I uh, welcome you and uh, look forward to the uh, debate. I want to, like in the other occasions, introduce uh, a first set of questions, uh, ask Santiago and Leonidas to address them, then move to a second set and then open the floor uh, to the uh, other participants who can uh, also write questions in the chat if they want. So uh, first sets of, of questions. Uh, as I mentioned, mass is uh, been considered as the ideal typical movement parties, being born from uh, strong with strong ties with the Cocaleros uh, movements. Uh, and uh, uh, your work has uh, pointed at the important but also differentiated relationship uh, between uh, uh, social movements and mass in different uh, uh, moments of their life. I think Santiago is a bit more optimistic than Leonidas, uh, and this, uh, looking at this relationship is see, important uh, uh, to discuss. Now, both of you have uh, stressed uh, the uh, tensions between uh, Evo Morales in powers and uh, uh, the different social movements with uh, Evo Morales uh, uh, being maybe more open to listen to the cocaleros, but also their um, tensions. Uh, and one of, of the questions I wanted to ask is how much uh, these uh, uh, tensions played a role uh, in uh, the uh, defeat of, uh, uh, or uh, in the troubles that uh, uh, developed in Bolivia and brought about the first defeat uh, of Morales, who had to uh, leave the countries, uh, attempt coup d'etat, and uh, the uh, uh, difficulties that it seems uh, to uh, uh, develop between uh, a sort of uh, uh, top-down and uh, vertical uh, uh, management of power. 
uh, and the social movements uh, uh, of different types. So maybe Santiago can start addressing these questions. I yes. think I should be yes. all right. Excellent. Yeah, you are. Um, wonderful. It's it's really <laughs> wonderful to be here, and and I really I, I want to thank you, Donatella, for the invitation. Um, I'm absolutely humbled to hear that you have learned something from my work, but uh, I should say that the the mutual learning is still extraordinarily uneven, and I have learned far more far more from you, and from several of the participants here, including Leo, including Professor Taro, who is I see. Is, in, in the screen. Um, um, so thank you again for the invitation. This is this is great. I reflect on the roots of, of the tensions um, that you ask us to think about. So the and and hopefully they will tell us something about the the, the roots of the political debacle uh, that the mass suffered last year. And I promise to leave plenty of room for follow up questions. Um, but as Donatella said, the mass is uh, what I consider a crystal uh, or a clear example of a movement based political party. It's a bottom up party in its genesis and, it, and in its early organizational development. It is also a case where a rural social movement of coca growers in alliance with other movements generated their own political leadership, formed their own political party to compete in elections, captured the reins of power very quickly. So only 10 years after its emergence and then govern for over a decade while maintaining to some extent or some degree of autonomous mobilization capacity. And this was all quite remarkable. You know, we can add all sorts of buts and however, but that's a large picture. Now, equally remarkable was the party's impressive electoral comeback, but we'll talk about that in the second round of questions. They are, you know, both questions are related, as you will see later. So as a party of movements, made by movements, the mass is quite interesting in the region too. So to add some comparative perspective, it is a product of indigenous mobilization. And that makes it different from the PT in Brazil, which is perhaps the other clear example of a movement-based party that governed also during the so-called left turn in Latin America. What's especially interesting about the Bolivian case is that against most expectations, uh, at least in the scholarship, sponsoring and allied social movements were able to retain strong links with the, with the mass while the mass was in power and help the party to avoid at least extreme forms of professionalization. But as you said, Donatella, party movement interactions were never without their conflicts and their tensions. And they really strained since 2009, and especially and probably during, uh, no, or, or during and after the 2011 Tipnis crisis. And the Tipnis crisis was a conflict over the construction of a highway through an autonomous indigenous territory. Since then, the relationships between the mass and lowland indigenous movements that were key to propel the party to power began to deteriorate and um, quite sharply. Morales also attempted, attempted to narrow the space for autonomy of civil society and to suppress bottom-up energies. This is something that Leo documents very well in his research. However, the ability of the party's social basis to retain some degree of autonomous mobilization capacity helped to hold party leaders accountable and steer policies in their desired directions. And at least on certain policy domains and on certain issues, th these pressures were also key in the realm of candidate selection, which will be crucial for the discussion of the second question too. So while these forms of accountability were far from perfect, far from egalitarian in Bolivia, they helped to at least partially counteract the strong tendencies toward top-down control associated or that we typically associate with concentrated charismatic executive authority. And context matters in my reflections here. So these forms of accountability to the party's base and internal responsiveness were largely absent or weaker, at least, in other leftist governments in the region. So that's why in comparative perspective, the, um, um, they were pretty notable. 
for quite some time, this um, forms of accountability and responsiveness were also a source of organizational strength uh, for, the, for the mass. And I would argue that they still are. So the performance results of the mass in power were largely impressive, with a lots of caveats, of course, again, uh, but the close links between social movements and a governing party of their own making, of their own creation, helped to usher in an, imp an impressive process of uh, political and social integration in the country that brought excluded indigenous populations closer to the centers of uh, power. Can they trigger the, uh, a, a massive circulation of political elites? Particularly when you look at this from the longer arc of uh, Bolivian history. So groups that were previously out of politics, out of the political game, or that had previously little say over how the country was run, gained greater power and influence. And this helped to break with traditional hierarchies and barriers to political participation in a country long characterized by deep ethnic divisions and exclusion. So lower class inclusion since the arrival of mass in 2006 meant that for the formal representation of previously excluding groups increased quite dramatically and perhaps irreversibly and policy making outcomes tended to favor broader societal constituencies than ever before. So leading to the reduction of inequalities that had been widely documented and causing a shift towards a more inclusive type of democracy. And as I say this, this kind of reflects the optimism that you mentioned, Donatella, and, and I'm not that optimistic in real, in, in real life, but this is kind of the broad picture and kind of overdoing some claims. But, but I think it holds some truth. So, and, but all, there's always a but here. And essentially, the, the mass could not escape uh, the most damaging side effects of what Ken Roberts and I call the autocratic temptations. And these temptations were deeply rooted in the party's formative experience, something that I guess Leo can tell us much more about. This happened in a highly exclusionary democracy that systematically excluded uh, indigenous and other stigmatized groups from power. And these experiences of social and cultural exclusion give rise to an understanding of democracy in terms of popular sovereignty or mass empowerment, rather than the institutionalized exercise of constitutional power. And in fact, the movements that formed the, the mass and that shaped the mass since early on in the early organizational development conceived of democracy as entailing the substantive grassroots empowerment and increased equality in social and economic outcomes. So they conceived of democracy as a redemptive invocation of popular sovereignty rather than a form of institutionalized pluralism. The, and this is an important point just that goes to the core of your question, Donatella. Um, so as the party consolidated electoral dominance and enjoyed sustained majoritarian support for, for quite some time, it fell prey to a mode of governing that was marked by deep temptations to concentrate power, marginalize opponents, and fragment and weaken opponents, including former movement allies. So ultimately, trying to bring my response to a full circle, those very same autocratic temptations that were real became a source of instability and upheaval in the country. On the one hand, they sharply polarized politics by creating a binary divide that helped to unite opposition coalitions, opposition coalitions that serve as countervailing uh, forces. And these temptations weakened the party's own basis of support, even encouraging big important movement allies to move into opposition in key moments so where the, when the mass most needed them elite polarization in bolivia was then reinforced by the emergence of right-wing protest movements that added a mass dimension to the polarization processes and that that's one of the big consequences of the autocratic temptations on the other hand the autocratic tendencies weakened the mass electorally and weaken its mobilizational capacity. So by October of 2019, last year, but it seems like you know, 20 years ago, Evo's disgusting and weakening, um, the electoral decline of the mass were real. So, and in fact, 
last year's vote in 2019, we could see um, that was largely a voto castigo, like a punishment vote against Morales' autocratic temptation against Morales' re-election attempt. This attempt was ignoring you know, well-established uh, democratic norms in the country. So it wasn't so much against the mass and its policies and um, what happened last year. And so after the post-electoral protest erupted last year, several of Morales' allies, including the, uh, the, the COP, the major workers central in the country, um, were um, either weakened or you could say unwilling to defend their government. And this point is one that I will underline and will come back to uh, in the second round of questions. And yet, as an aside, it bears noting that, you know, in mistake, many mistakes were committed and abuses of power and so on. But I would, you know, it bears noting again that the removal from office hardly followed constitutional procedures. Uh, in the country. This is not the key point, you know, um, uh, behind your question, but I wanted to say it too. So um, I, I think I probably talked more than I, that, that you wanted me to talk, Donatella, but I hope I left enough room for follow-up questions. Thank you very much, Santiago. Uh, and um, uh, Leo has uh, published also uh, the results of his uh, comparative work on uh, uh, the uh, Cocaleros and the uh, uh, Movimento al Socialismo, uh, the mass uh, in a book uh, uh, called Political Strategies and Social Movements in Latin America, uh, Comparison of Zapateros and Cocaleros. Uh, what's your perspective? Uh, hello, hello from Crete. I'm very happy to be back at uh, SMS, even, even digitally, and I'm very happy to see you, uh, Donatella, Santiago, uh, the friends that uh, I can see uh, who are also present, friends and colleagues. So, uh, coming to your question, uh, the mass, of course, has definitely been, you know, a movement party in the sense that it started off uh, as a coalition, a network of uh, social actors, social movements that played a very critical and crucial role during the cycle of protest of 2000-2005, which uh, had also you know, gathered uh, around a political instrument, the mass that became the institutional kind of uh, response to the crisis of neoliberalism that the country was going through <coughs> and which eventually uh, skyrocketed uh, that political instrument to the government seat. Uh, however, from my point of view, in, back then, in 2005, the mass was still more of a social movement and less of a governing party, a movement party that had to learn how to exercise state power. And uh, with time, I believe that the party slowly kind of overshadowed the movement and the mass became more of a governing party and less of a social movement. Uh, in short, the movement became kind of the political instrument of the party. Uh, now, when we view the, the mass uh, as a movement party or as a party movement, we have to look at two levels. The first is the street level, where movements normally organize, plan, act, etc. Uh, in this sense, the mass is known as the political instrument of the social movements or of the six federations of the coca producer uh, coca producers of the tropic of cochabamba which is actually what i studied i looked i looked mostly at the small picture how the six federations and why uh, decide to uh, establish a political party but sometimes the small picture has to say a lot about the big picture you know sometimes uh, small places uh, talk about big issues and uh, the mass was initially actually born as the political instrument of the indigenous campesinos, of the rural indigenous farmers of Bolivia. It was a coalition of the rural indigenous movement, not only the movement of the coca producers. And it was formed by uh, several uh, federations and confederations of trade unions, of uh, indigenous of the highlands, of the lowlands, uh, of uh, women, the Bartolinas, for example. 
I'm not going to, to name all the, uh, all the confederations that participated in, in uh, the establishment of the mass, but what I want to say is that it was the political instrument of uh, the rural indigenous of Bolivia. The six federations, the Cocaleros of uh, the Chapare, participated also and eventually managed to win the internal hegemony, I would say, uh, of, of the political instrument. And uh, for that, Evo Morales was uh, very, uh, very important and instrumental. He was the most voted deputy in the country in uh, 1997, for example, in, in the Chapare. And then we had other uh, confederations uh, that joined this process, like the Conamac, like uh, the Central Obrera Boliviana, uh, that Santiago also mentioned, and uh, joined this, uh, this umbrella, and they helped push uh, forward, uh, you know, electoral victories, uh, the rewriting of the constitution, which made Bolivia a plurinational state, and uh, in theory also protects uh, the rights of uh, Pachamama, which became a very crucial issue and uh, an issue behind, you know, the, the conflict that eventually came up between um, the indigenous movements and the mass. Uh, Already six years into uh, the mass and Evo Morales rule, Conamac and Sidob, for example, will leave the alliance mainly because of uh, the uh, because they saw it as violating the very principles of uh, the alliance, especially when it comes to protecting uh, Pachamama against uh, national or foreign capital exploitation. Uh, the, the big rupture, the, the biggest rupture comes with the issue of Tipnis, uh, when the mass actually tries to, uh, to build a highway through a national park. The indigenous movements of, uh, of the area mostly, but also of the country, organized, they organized nine uh, marches uh, in total, and some of them were repressed by the mass, by the government of the movements. And uh, they were generally disillusioned uh, by, by the party because the, there was a vast difference between rhetoric and praxis uh, of the mass. Uh, it was elected under the banner of uh, the indigenous cause. Uh, it used symbols like the Wipala, the image of the coca leaf, which also plays a symbolic role here. Uh, because they have to do with the respect and protection of Mother Earth, the Pachamama, which is also a symbol of the indigenous culture of the country, uh, an, an indigenous culture that has been discriminated against for 500 years. But over the years, the mass becomes something else. Uh, of course, it makes Bolivia richer, more socially inclusive. These, these are uh, feats that belong to the mass and should be attributed to it. Poverty uh, is reduced extremely, literacy rates uh, increase, uh, but at the same time Bolivia becomes much more deforestated, more extractivist, more capitalist, and when the movements protest, they are met with uh, repression or cooptation at times. Just to name two examples, uh, Conamac and Sidob that assisted the process of the cambio, uh, right now are split actually in two. There is the Conamac that sides with the mass and the Conamac Organico that doesn't side with the mass and the same story uh, is with Sido. And that does not mean that they have slipped more towards the right. Maybe the mass has. In the Chapare also where I worked, there were already voices when I was conducting my research that sometimes, you know, the, the trade unions uh, develop authoritarian tendencies. Of course, the, the Chapare has been the stronghold and is still the stronghold of the mass, despite those voices. But the, the relationship between the movements and the party is, is kind of a bitter story. It's not a very uh, romantic story, let's say. Now, the second level we have to look at uh, is uh, the, the party and the government palace. So the first, the first uh, government of the mass was something else we had. Uh, you know, activists, movement people, uh, Aymaras, Quechuas, uh, women who were uh, the leaders of the domestic workers and became ministers of justice. We have a different kind of government, uh, which was more indigenous, more uh, related to the social movements, which, however, with time was replaced by, by technocrats. And uh, statistically speaking, uh, in the first government of mass, 
the popular movements uh, represented around 70% of the cabinet compared to 30% which were you know invited intellectuals slash technocrats a few years later this relationship uh, went the other way around 60% uh, uh, technocrats and 40% related to the movements and uh, that's how actually uh, it continued and in 2013 uh, for example uh, we only had something like 15% uh, of the uh, government uh, being uh, people who are actually activists and related to the movements. We had that turn towards uh, professionalization, let's say, and the preference toward technocrats for, for the government. So, uh, this thing and the fact that uh, social movements, uh, you know, feminist movements, uh, indigenous people's movements, uh, ecologists, and the, also the fact that the mass, and especially Evo Morales, was seen as violating uh, the very constitution that he helped uh, actually get approved, uh, and especially when it comes to uh, the re-election, the presidential re-election, uh, because this is the first time the mass is actually defeated uh, in all these years, in 2016, uh, in the referendum for the re-election that it lost, the mass is seen as becoming more autocratic, uh, kind of corrupt as well, and uh, that also played a role uh, in, in last year's election and in the fact that it didn't have uh, the social approval that it used to enjoy uh, in the past. Now, what uh, happened after that, in this year that looks like 20 years, as Santiago mentioned, uh, I'll get back to it in the second question. Thank you, uh, Leonidas, uh, and thank you, Santiago, for this first uh, uh, set of uh, interesting uh, remarks. And in fact, the second question is about something that uh, uh, maybe um, nobody expected. We are accustomed to long crises and long dictatorship in Latin America. Uh, with the Bolivian case, notwithstanding the initial dramatic situations with uh, Evo Morales leaving the countries, uh, uh, huge repression, violent uh, uh, violation, uh, of human rights and so on, uh, the crisis has been relatively short. So between November 2019 and October 2020, it seems that uh, some democratic standards have been uh, re-established and especially uh, uh, movimental socialism mass uh, has re-entered power. And uh, uh, this seems to be uh, also uh, linked with other developments on the left in Latin America, but with all the specificity of the Bolivian case uh, that has been often uh, uh, compared in the Latin America with uh, uh, the, um, the conditions in Venezuela or Ecuador, or even Argentina, but it, which remain quite different, not only with respect to more horizontal type of politics and the importance of the social movements uh, during uh, the periods of the left in powers, but also because of type of the policies that, as Leonidas said, had uh, some uh, um, looked problematic on issues like environment, uh, uh, and inclusiveness, but also reduced inequalities uh, uh, in uh, the countries. So the, the uh, quest second set of questions is more about uh, uh, this uh, uh, um, success to a certain extent uh, of mass that's uh, uh, probably only a few uh, optimistic were uh, uh, expecting. Uh, how did it happen? Uh, that's uh, uh, and how social movements mobilized under conditions that seems uh, of uh, uh, strong uh, attacks against the left in Bolivia and in all Latin America, it was the same periods in which uh, in Venezuela uh, also attempted coup d'etat uh, developed. And uh, uh, so 
to which extent uh, was after all uh, the the uh, policies of uh, uh, mass and evo morales when in power sustaining a sort of uh, uh, coalition pro mass uh, uh, how did social movements uh, mobilized uh, because we have seen uh, a lot of uh, um, strong uh, uh, resistance uh, to the uh, attempted coup uh, and uh, uh, mobilizations of uh, uh, social movements, especially uh, indigenous, but not only them. And uh, uh, also in the return of mass in power, can we expect a sort of self-reflexivity uh, about the previous mistakes in the interactions uh, with uh, the, the social movements that constituted uh, the basis of the party, uh, or to which extent uh, the return of mass is also an effect of a sort of compromise that will uh, affect the development of uh, the interactions of uh, the uh, party leadership, at least with uh, the uh, social movement actors. So, who wants to go first? Sant uh, Santiago, please. Okay. Um, well, that was a, a great intervention, Leo, and, and a great uh, set of questions, uh, Donatella. The, um, this was a surprising comeback, um, especially considering the wide margin of victory. We'll talk about that in a second. As you said, it was a um, a short political crisis, but uh, it felt long, like any other thing this this past year. And I will try to tie up my comments here to the regional patterns that you mentioned before, and the, the end of the left turn and the post left turn political order. Probably some notes about Argentina, Donatella, and I agree with the the, the how you formulated the question and how important it is to actually uh, redirect attention from exogenous factors to a focus on the political failings and misdeeds of, of, of these governments, of the left-turn governments in Latin America. So the, the need for a vigorous self-introspection and an autocritica seems to be urgent now more than ever, perhaps, that the left is tasked with governing again. Um, and I'll, I'll mention to what extent there are some good signs about this or not in, in, in my remarks. But uh, so first, let me talk about the masses' impressive comeback and, um, and remobilization uh, of its basis. So this happened, to put it in context, with Morales in exile in Argentina, uh, with limited access to public resources and with mass leaders and supporters facing violent and widely documented uh, persecution. Everybody that I know, at least, expected the mass would collapse or splinter like any other personalistic political party. To understand the mass's comeback, and it's, cri it's, it's critical to look at two dimensions, and I'm, I'm going to be very, very binary in my response. It's like two sides of everything today. <laughs> so it's, it's important to look at the behavior of the mass in Congress, as you know, the mass retained a majority in Congress while Morales was in exile. And it's also look, important to look at the behavior of the social movement basis. Both of this re, uh, gained relative autonomy vis-a-vis -vis Morales, and both of them acted quite strategically. So first, um, you know, more, more broadly, I want to underscore two points. So first, the mass cannot be reduced to a personalistic vehicle for a charismatic leader or simply understood as a co-optative machine under the control, the full control of a unified leader. Uh, and this became quite clear in this uh, past year. So although the mask does contain elements of you know, both of these elements, and although, as Leo just told us, both of these trends fortified over time, the mask was always a, more than that too. So it was more than a personalistic vehicle. So the second point is that the mass, the, the party movement interactions experience a lot of internal shifts under the Morales presidencies. And, and Leo was, Leo's remarks were very good in that um, uh, sense. So in broad strokes, 
the connections with social movements, I would claim, function differently under different constellations of power. For example, uh, before the party attained electoral dominance in 2009, before the party captured full control over core political institutions, and while the party was confronting a mobilized opposition in the first few years after it captured the presidency, uh, the party retained great deals of this you know, early participatory ethos or high political um, uh, or high power dispersion within the party. And things changed later. I think, you know, I, I will stick to what Leo said before and, and with some of the points that I made in my remarks. And still, and, and, and this is where I, mine may be a, an unpopular opinion, I did not see a period of nearly complete demobilization and of you know, massive weakening of the organizational power of Bolivian movements. And I think those claims can be sometimes overstated. And that's why I said before that perhaps um, you no know, wary of Morales' overreach and attempts to do um, to, to violate the important norms in the country and carry out a more autocratic project, movements probably were unwilling to defend Morales and his government rather than incapable of doing that. So social movements proved to be to, not to be demobilized during the Anis regime. So uh, what we saw initially right after Morales left was a moment of absolute shock and confusion in the wake of his ouster. So Morales was gone. Anies quickly and very violently was repressing mass supporters, sympathizers, etc. So there were two massacres that sent powerful shockwaves. And so it was a very adverse setting uh, that, for, that, that gave rise to what you called in your question, uh, Donatella, the resistance. Uh, so kind of the, the beginning of the resistance. And predictably, so some of the attempts to roll back inclusion that were kind of a serious thrust of the of the of the Anis government. So attempts to roll back some of Morales's policies, attempts to undermine and even to proscribe the mass, produce counter mobilization. So this was quite predictable. So I, I would have expected that initially. And the, the the more unpredictable consequences were that they helped to produce a realignment of the country's largest movements behind the mass. And so violent repression fostered unity and, and raised the costs of exiting the mass and just opting you know, for a new electoral vehicle or run their own candidates on, on, on another platform. Um, and these realignments were important, was heavily conditioned by a contingent factor. So the timing of the pandemic was important, the gross mismanagement of the economic crisis, the inability of Anies to also achieve her political goals and so on kind of helped. You know, in certain moments, you could see them as you know, helping the mass. In other moments, they were just undermining the mass. And, and I'm happy to talk about those moments later. But so unity was not preordained, however, and it was hard to attain. And, and I can, as I said before, I can mention some key moments as I saw them at least. And also, I should say, in fairness, from afar, right? So I wasn't in Bolivia when this kind of realignment was happening. Um, so allied movements, those that formed the unity pact, I think that Leo mentioned it before, uh, showed some independence of action, strategic behavior uh, uh, in opposition, and even, I would say, prudence as well as a commitment, a strong commitment to an institutional and electoral resolution to the political crisis. And what we saw within the mass were clear tensions uh, over tactical positions. So the, the, the huge tension there was between pushing for elections versus pushing for a more insurrectionary approach to the resolution of the crisis, a push Anies out. And there were also pushes from social movements to reclaim ownership of the political instrument. So to make the, the, the instrument again subordinate to social movements and not the other way around. And uh, there were challenges to what used to be a fairly unified uh, political leadership. So huge pressures toward um, um, uh, generational renewal of the party. And those were some of the dynamics at work. And the, the, the result? And uh, was what we might consider, 
a return to the origins type of dynamics. While the party appears to be outliving and um, uh, its dominant leader. So it's a painful renewal of, of a dominant uh, leadership. So I'll do, I, I do not want to overstate this point, um, but it is significant um, or it's something that we should pay attention to, especially so when we look at the renewal of um, or the trajectories of other movement-based parties and how difficult it is to outlive uh, their uh, founding uh, dominant and charismatic leaders. Then you can grab any other of your choice and what's happening in the case of Bolivia seems to be quite interesting. So in terms of the dynamics in the works, the, the party's movement bases have demanded the um, and the elimination of the figure that, that they call the invitado, or the invited, when the mass invites candidates as an attempt to reach out to the, um, the median voter and middle classes and so on. And this was a major tension line within the mass since very early on. It's a strategy that the mass implemented to just bring familiar faces or people with some symbolic type of capital so that they would kind of gain name recognition and win over um, uh, urban voters. And in light of the crisis, the social movement basis of the party demanded the elimination of that. And, and they have pretty much succeeded at doing that, although with caveats. So movements have pushed aggressively to reclaim fuller control over, uh, over um, the, the selection of candidates for legislative um, offices. And, and they have demanded the end of the dasos or the handpicking of candidates, a process that was very familiar before where Evo Morales kind of wielded, you know, or had the last word in some instances in the selection of candidates. And in fact, the social movement bases have wielded significant um, power over candidate selection procedures in the 2020 elections. So if you look at the composition of electoral lists, um, um, they, they have done fairly well in pushing for their desired candidates and succeeding at that. And in my view, it's early to tell, but they will likely control uh, the selection of, of party candidates in the lead up to the regional elections um, in next year. Although if you check the newspapers just today, you're seeing some tensions there. Evo Morales is trying to play uh, um, um, a more active role in the pre-screening of candidates. And I would expect a tension uh, in, in that area can, you know, coming up. And my reflection on this is that this attempt of, from the social basis to defend, uh, to, to eliminate the figure of in, invited and, and gain greater control over candidate selection, is, you know, tends to, I tend to see this as a good sign of vibrancy and openness, but it can also be a double-edged sword for the party. So the mass needs quite pressingly to rebuild connections in urban areas. That's where it lost you know, more votes and, 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 and kind of symbolic um, capital. And, and it's also the areas where the political space is not monopolized by strong social movement organizations. And I think this is relevant because to me, the future of Bolivian politics will likely be increasingly decided by this largely urban and growing populations that the mass actually helped to propel to the middle class. They took a hit with Agnes, but still probably a part of the story will be decided there and in the years to come. And although movements and a densely organized uh, society provides the basis for the reorganization of the mass, the party will need to work hard to build connections in, um, in cities uh, where it doesn't always have um, uh, majorities. So that's one, one line of, of, of kind of uh, reaccommodation within the party, kind of who controls candidate selections. The movements also push to allow the heads of, uh, of uh, large movements to be the heads of ministries. That was something that Evo had refused in the past. And this, of course, opens up the door for, or it makes the possibilities of co-optation more likely, even if though you know, movement will gain more space in the, uh, in the administration. And um, so I, I said way too much. I want to wrap up with one quick point, Donatella, if you don't mind, but linking those, these ideas with the, the, the title of today's seminar that you asked that change continuity or whatever. And, and I promise to come back to this. And so the mass's impressive comeback is, is the second major, major case after Argentina of a polarizing left party returning to power very quickly after losing it. So as you said, it's just that 
a year in Bolivia, four years in Argentina. It marked a partial solution to a crisis, to a tense political impasse, and it probably represents a step towards redemocratization. Unlike Argentina, this was not a routine alternation of power with little social mobilization and social movements in Bolivia were key protagonists here in the defense of democracy. They were key countervailing pressures against a decidedly non-democratic project. And the Bolivia's left turn probably signals the possibility of a, of a re-equilibration with more moderate and less polarizing political leadership. So it can be an opportunity to deepen inclusion and, and strengthen those dimensions that the mass didn't really uh, strengthen, like the checks and balances and, and all sorts of things. And this remains to be seen, but, um, but um, I do not, what I do not see is a return to the status quo ex ante, like um, a Morales' era type of comeback. Um, but probably that is my optimism for the day, and, and, and I'm overdoing it. But I'm going to end on an optimistic note today. Why not? Thank you, Santiago. Uh, Leo, are you optimistic also about the return to the origins? I'm not really sure. I'm not particularly optimistic, but I have never been on the, <laughs> on the other hand. Uh, thank you, Santiago, for this excellent intervention. Uh, well, my, my take is that, you know, when we talk about the last year's uh, coup d'etat, and last year's crisis, I believe that we are mostly talking about Evo Morales, who had been, you know, the biggest weapon for the mass for 14 years, and then he eventually became uh, its uh, Achilles heel. Especially after the 2016 referendum, which is the first time that Evo loses an electoral battle, uh, Evo starts being seen as extremely, you know, authoritarian, uh, and uh, the image that the Bolivians had of him, because the Europeans and probably the Americans had a different one, uh, the image the Bolivians had was that, you know, he was a person who was from a humble background, but eventually fell in love with power and couldn't just let it go. So if you were for social inclusion and uh, you are a Bolivian, I mean, you have to recognize that the mass did a great job, even though it did so by empowering the poor without really having to disempower the rich. But then if your, you know, your dominant identity of selection is, let's say, ecology, uh, then you cannot be satisfied with the mass because, you know, extractivism, both hydrocarbon and mining skyrocketed in the country during the mass years. And even though it had the rhetoric of uh, nationalization, it kind of actually renegotiated a better deal and uh, coexisted quite well with foreign investment and transnational companies. They may not have been American. They are Spanish, Brazilian, Chinese or Japanese even, but they are there. And you, you, you can't help but noticing it, you know. And the mass also reached important agreements with the agro-business elites uh, of uh, Santa Cruz especially that have to do with the expansion of the agricultural frontier uh, in uh, the Amazonian part of Bolivia. Deforestation reached its peak under Evo. Uh, we had the introduction of you know, transgenic soya seeds, for example, uh, which was presented as the transfer of motor technology, etc. So if, if you are an ecologist, then you are not happy with Evo. Uh, now, if you are, uh, your identity is focused around the gender, then you can't be very happy either. Uh, Evo is the personification of machismo and patriarchy in Bolivia. And also, if you are liberal, the referendum and the re-election that he actually didn't uh, obey to the referendum that he lost, uh, you are not happy either. However, and this is a big however, uh, when you look at the other side, then you see a very racist economic elite that returns to power, assisted by, by the army and the police with a coup d'etat. I have no other name for this. And uh, even at the symbolic level, you see a kind of a revengeist, revengeful attitude, which sees itself as reconstituting the predominantly white elites, their religion, you know, this image of the Bible returning to the presidential palace was a very powerful, but also very symbolic uh, act. You know, you have the return of the values of, uh, of, the, of the elites, uh, which are definitely not meritocratic. And you have also a pogrom against everyone that was seen as having been associated with the mass. Uh, 
including you know mass mayors, politicians, the the vice president's uh, library was burned. It, it was brutal. So, and then you had the year of interim government during which. If the mass was seen as corrupt, you could you could see that uh, the new government and the old elites are at least equally corrupt, and they didn't really manage very well the health crisis, the COVID crisis. Uh, it, it went badly in Bolivia. We have something like 9,000 death, deaths in a country of 15 million. In Greece, for example, we have 2,000 deaths to, to compare. And then you see openly racist remarks by government officials, uh, you know, saying, you know, I have blue eyes and uh, fizzy hair, so I cannot be associated with a mass, th this kind of racist. Uh, and uh, you, this government, you can't help but noticing that it was far worse than uh, the mass. You also have two massacres, 30 people died, uh, and uh, you, you cannot really be happy with uh, the return of the elites unless you are white and rich and 40 to 60 percent of the country are not and even even then even the right wing the elites are kind of divided so social movements neighborhood assemblies especially in el alto uh, the cocaleros themselves the workers of the cop and the csu tsv they started a cycle of protest during the pandemic uh, which was reluctant at first uh, or even unwilling as santiago very well said to help the mass but then it went stronger as time went by, uh, intensifying in July and August. We had the roadblocks, more than 100 a day in all major cities. We had marches, we had a general strike called by the COB, uh, by the uh, Bartolinas, the women, the campesinas, uh, by the neighborhood assemblies of El Alto, and with three main demands. The announcement of a definite election date, because it was postponed four times, uh, the, the bad management of the COVID crisis by the government and the end to militarization and repression which was going on in the country and you know the Secretary of State uh, Arturo Murillo was seen as the personification of, of, of this militarization. So on the one hand you had the mass that had become authoritarian and you know even ecocidal if you want but uh, it was kind of redistributive, compensatory and socially inclusive in a way and uh, even though it had become corrupt, repressive, patriarchal, etc. Uh, and on the other hand, you had the nightmare that was coming back. So I believe that the Bolivians in general, including the social movements, opted not for the best option, but for the least bad, I would say. And the fact that Evo Morales was not the candidate for the uh, presidential seat, worked actually in favor of the mass for the first time in its history. And uh, who actually was seen during uh, the past 14 years as the, as the person who was behind the professionalization of the mass government, uh, the person who was bringing in the technocrats, uh, Luis Arce. And uh, David Tsukiwanka, who is the vice president now, has a, has a different background. He was more associated with the movements and he played actually a big role in the in the formation of the political instrument back in the 90s. Uh, as for what happens now, uh, I believe that we have to we have to see two things. Uh, the relationship between the mass and Evo Morales, who is not the president of the country, but he is the leader of the mass still. And uh, the relationship between the mass and Luis Arce and uh, how, how Arce is going to act vis-à-vis uh, -vis Evo Morales. And we also have to take into account that unemployment right now in Bolivia is the highest in, in 14 years. It has reached 11%. During Evo, Evo, the Evo years, the highest it, it reached was 6%. And we have also to take into account the um, actual importance of agro-business in the country's economy, of the uh, extractivist business in the country's economy as well. And uh, I, I don't believe that this government will, will actually treat it differently than previous uh, mass governments did. Uh, so, the critical to the mass movements that temporarily allied with it during the past year to get rid of uh, you know the return of the elites, uh, 
uh, they may have to go back against it uh, if it continues, if, if the mask continues the same policies. For example, already today I saw that uh, uh, some representatives of indigenous movements uh, were already dissatisfied with the new government, with the new cabinet of the mass, which is seen as uh, not uh, having any indigenous representatives uh, in it, only one, uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, and this dominated by uh, technocrats. Uh, again, new faces, new faces, but uh, technocrats. So I was also I was also not in Bolivia during this year. I was in Latin America, stranded in another country in Ecuador. So I also watched this from abroad. And uh, you know, political scientists uh, have never been very good in predictions. So we have to wait and see. <laughs> Thank you for these visions. That's uh, leaving aside the more optimistic or pessimistic uh, uh, accent. Uh, uh, goes, I think, in a very compatible uh, directions, which is uh, uh, it has been a crisis uh, uh, that has been produced uh, uh, by many two elements, policies and politics. So the increasing uh, plebiscitarian uh, uh, forms of democracy that has developed uh, um, during uh, the previous uh, uh, governments uh, of Evo Morales, uh, but also uh, the um, crisis related with uh, policies uh, that were uh, uh, quite impressive at the level of um, uh, challenging social inequalities, but uh, uh, less impressive at the levels of uh, uh, not only environmental uh, uh, policies, but also different types of uh, different forms of development, but also the uh, um, elements of the potentials for developing new coalitions. So we are never happy with the government of the day, but uh, uh, a government that opens up political opportunities is uh, uh, more uh, uh, welcoming also uh, to mobilization. Um, I want to see if there are questions. I also saw that some of uh, the Latin American uh, uh, Cosmos uh, people are there. Juan Masullo, Cesar Gutzman, do you have any question? But, uh, I have uh, a written question. Uh, Marie uh, Jasse says two questions. What do you make of the ministers that do come from social movement organizations? So, uh, Wilson Caceres is now removed, though uh, Wilson Caceres is now removed from office already in the cabinet of Arce. And how do you think relationship with CDOP and CONAMAC will uh, evolve? Uh, Leo, Leo, do you want to go ahead this time? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. So, uh, you, you, you are very right. Uh, one of the very few people who were actually related to uh, grassroots social movement organizations uh, had to be removed from office in a few days because there was a scandal and accusation of uh, nepotism uh, of actually employing an ex girlfriend to, to the office and he had to go, he was replaced by uh, another person and uh, in, in, in reality uh, I was going through uh, the profile of uh, the persons in the new cabinet and uh, to be honest, first of all, there are, it, is, it is again uh, a cabinet dominated by men uh, we have something like 13 men and uh, probably three women, uh, out of which uh, one comes from, is a mass militant, but comes from uh, uh, an elite kind of family background. Uh, another one, uh, Veronica Navia, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, uh, is, uh, a, is a sociologist who is, uh, uh, has accompanied uh, social movements in, in her trajectory, 
but he is also, you know, middle class uh, educated. She's, she's not an indigenous uh, activist herself. And uh, I think that, um, and al already I saw uh, some comments from CSU uh, TSB, for, for example, saying that, you know, again, uh, we have invitees, we have technocrats, uh, we have intellectuals, and we don't have, we don't have indigenous people in, in, in the cabinet, and uh, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, Luis Arce was already seen as a person that was promoting over, uh, over these uh, 14 years this transformation. Uh, of of the party of the of the government actually, uh, which became more uh, professional, more technocratic, and uh, not so much close to, uh, not directly uh, related to to the movements and as uh, it did in the past. So I think uh, I think we are along the same lines when when we come to that. As for the relationship with uh, Sidov and Konamak, uh, first of all they have both split. Uh, we have a part of Sidob and the part of Konamak, which is controlled by the mass. And uh, actually, in the past, we had uh, you know the invasion of uh, uh, mass uh, activists who occupied the offices of the organizations because they were seen as uh, traitors, which is you know that uh, what the mass says when it doesn't like uh, what you say about it. And uh, we have the Sidov uh, Organico, the Konamak Organico, uh, and uh, no, no idea. I think that temporarily, at least, uh, Sidov and Konamak will uh, not voice uh, protest, at least for now, but uh, if we have the same policies, especially when it comes to uh, the expansion of uh, the agricultural frontier, the extractivist, uh, uh, businesses, etc. Then I, I, I don't, I'm, I don't expect to see a different picture. To be honest. Thank you, Santiago. Uh, I think I yes. Um, I don't. I actually don't think I have more more to add to Le, uh, Leo's response. It, it it was you know roughly what I would have said. The um, you know, he, I think Leo identified the, the 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 ministry the minister that just fell. Uh, and this was a recent, very recent development. The um, perhaps maybe the maybe the one the, the one minor point to add is that I don't see as this being a core priority for the government at this time. So I, I early to tell how these relationships will reconfigure, but uh, the 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 issue now I think from the point of view of, of Arce is how to tame or how to approach the, the the right in Santa Cruz and and you know with the the story of recovering economic growth and gaining the, the lingering economic crisis and and more concessions are being made to um you know to to those segments but i haven't seen any you know in the, some some pushes from movements to um, you know, against the the ministry, the, the the configuration of the cabinet. In the end, most movements accepted them. Um, and in the last ampliado of the mass that I you know read the the the, the summaries, the, there were no big concerns there. Mostly around the the, the process of candidate selection um, and just to displace Morales from from you know controlling that. Um, and but Leo identified the, the tension lines there that the organizations side divided are split, and um, so there's there has to be a process within those organizations to reconfigure their leadership, unify. If, if um, and but I I don't I I'm not expect I'm I'm pessimistic in that dimension perhaps like just like Leo. I have a, uh, thank you both. Uh, I have uh, two other questions that I will uh, read one after the other and then uh, give you the floor for final remarks. Uh, one is from uh, Cesar Gutzman Concha uh, and uh, uh, he says, uh, uh, notwithstanding uh, uh, what uh, uh, Mass did right, there was maybe that right with capital letter, right wing mm -hmm. parties that made some mistakes. Uh, uh, in particular in keeping the parliament open and uh, uh, in um, the uh, uh, role of the military. And um, there is another question by uh, 
Juan Masulo uh, that's uh, um, ask especially how to locate uh, the Bolivia case in a comparative perspective, uh, looking, for instance, at Peru, but I would add also looking at Brazil, so what can we learn? Uh, and he says uh, um, some other uh, analysts on Latin America have been quick in calling, along with Chile too, uh, a new wave of mobilizations in the regions. Do you see any points in common? Is it worth looking at these developments within the regions as the unit of analysis? So which are, in a comparative perspective, uh, signs that in fact have been read as a sort of uh, return uh, uh, of the left after the revival of the left in Latin America it had been proclaimed death, but uh, uh, Chile, uh, Argentina first, Chile, and then Bolivia seems to uh, indicate some uh, way uh, so towards successful uh, resistance uh, and uh, uh, the, the Peru case, but also Brazil seems to be uh, central uh, point for um, comparison. So, San Santiago, maybe I give the floor to you first now. Okay. Um, so, Cesar, um, it's, it's a very provocative question about the... So, we know what the mass did right and some of the things that the mass did wrong, but what did the right with a capital did wrong? And, and I would say just as a... Um, um, you know, let's start with what they did right. So on the one hand, it seems to me that the right finally learned to protest and that's a concerning thing. Um, and what they did, um, they, they did wrong pretty much anything else. They, they, they failed to accomplish their uh, political goals and um, you know, not close, you know, closing the, the Congress would have been probably suicidal. Um, um, and could have been really, really, really hard. Um, and but I, I do not want to say it was a mistake that they <laughs> that they made, right? It, it was just um, they 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 played an institutional game uh, on the one hand, and then they tried to accomplish their goal via repression and um, and so forth, um, persecution. On the other hand, the. Um, in terms of what they did wrong, poor management of the of of the economic uh, crisis, like Leo identified, of the public health crisis that they um, they, they manage it terribly. The um, and essentially, I think violating the basic and the basic function of an interim government. Um, so I think that 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 was a it's it's a no no. And uh, Bolivian had precedents of interim governments actually doing their job and being an, a neutral arbiter and leading up a, a democratic transition. And Arce, that was a, a, a fundamental mistake, uh, initially saying that she would not run for office and then changing her mind and then um, uh, actually changing her mind again. Um, so plenty of mistakes on part of the, of the, of the right. The, um, no, and not only mistakes, but actually gross violations of human rights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Just to be clear, it was not just uh, missteps that they that they made. The in terms of locating Bolivia in comparative perspective, um, I, I really will try to be succinct. And the um, whether there is a, a resurgence of the left. Um, and I would refrain, just like Leo said before, we're terrible at predictions and so on. But what we are seeing. Um, it, 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 it's the, the emergence of a new normal, if you will, um, but, but um, it's kind of forming unevenly across the board. So kind of there are swirling winds in all directions. There is mobilization and counter mobilization uh, in the region over different things, I think. And the, the how, to, how to put this quickly, the... Let's see the following. So you do see the across the board, you see heightened levels of polarization in the region, and and um, not clear whether what we're seeing is the beginning of of normal routine alternations of power across the world. I said that I remain optimistic in the Bolivian case, 
period uh, because I see that here it has the potential of, of normalizing in that sense, not because I'm expecting all good things coming and, and an easy going transition to anything, but it seems that the conditions are, there's a best case scenario for the country to um, uh, uh, restore you know, routine alternations in power. Argentina attained that, so there's an alternation of right and left, uh, fairly normal politics, if you want, you know, quote unquote normal. Um, but then the um, you see countervailing pressures across the board in the Chilean case, kind of the protests that resemble to some extent to what we saw in Bolivia in the early 2000s. Um, so like a period of, of broad societal rejection of the political class and the establishment. That's not the kind of dynamics we're seeing in Argentina and even now in Bolivia or in, in Brazil. Um, so I, I would have trouble kind of identifying a unified label for what's going on in the region. Now, only to say that the, probably the, the left turn as we knew it before is, is over and now it's being uh, reconfigured, but there's not a new kind of um, unified wave in, in any you know, unilinear kind of direction. Thank you. Uh, Santiago Leonidas. Thank you. Uh, excellent points, Santiago. Uh, hi, Cesar. Hi, Juan. The first question, uh, the, the mistakes of, of the right wing. I also think that what Santiago said uh, about protests is uh, very important. You know, we had this, uh, this role played by the Comités Civicos and uh, this adoption uh, of repertoires that uh, used to belong to the left, uh, marches, uh, you know, roadblocks, this kind of stuff, that they, that they did actually do and they did them well, which is worrying if you ask me. Uh, on the other hand, I believe that they were, you know, the, the right wing and the, and the old elites, let's say, and I would add to that the old middle classes because, uh, and I'm, I'm somebody who has lost many friends uh, during this year, uh, because uh, one of the uh, very important, actually, changes that took place in Bolivia uh, over the 14 years of uh, the mass rule uh, had to do with that, had to do with uh, some previously poor being elevated uh, to the middle class, being able to send their kids to university, they were able to make some money, they were able to get access to the state apparatus and uh, obtain positions uh, within the state apparatus, which are not too many and which uh, were in the past the positions that the old middle classes and the old elites uh, would uh, have for themselves. So there was also this, uh, this point that is important in what happened in the protests that uh, the right wing managed to, managed to sustain. But I believe that the, 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 right, uh, the right were so excited uh, about their uh, return to power that they made so many mistakes that have to do with uh, the repression, the, the racist kind of identity that they brought forward, extremely racist, uh, which uh, actually compared to the strategies of uh, the mass in 2000-2005, which had a rather, you know, inclusive uh, kind of strategy, uh, even though it was focusing on uh, the indigenous identity, uh, but it was inclusive for other people in Bolivia that were not indigenous, this year we saw the opposite. Uh, the indigenous were the devil. And uh, this played a role in, in their, uh, together with the repression, in their uh, losing the election big time, as well as the fact that they didn't really have uh, a plan that would unite uh, the right wing uh, around it. Uh, they were fragmented as well. Uh, Agnes, as Santiago said, first said she would run, then she wouldn't run, then she would run, and uh, this was not seen very well, this was not perceived very well uh, in uh, Bolivian politics. And then uh, we had 
the army and uh, the police uh, that played a kind of you know dirty uh, role during this process, bloody role during this process, and also we have to see uh, what uh, what the mass will do now with uh, the army leaders, with the police leaders, uh, the Secretary of State is actually into hiding right now, nobody knows where he is, uh, then we may have a process, a judiciary process against uh, Agnes uh, as well, so what is also interesting is what the mass will do now that it, it is back uh, into power and whether it will also show this, you know, revanchist. Uh, kind of uh, attitude because it will have an impact on on, on uh, the image of uh, of the party. As for the the second question, the question of Juan, I, I wish I, I would also add Ecuador to your uh, to your question, which is also an important uh, case, especially when it comes to you know the the return to neoliberal policies that uh, Lenin Moreno uh, tried to promote. Uh, and then uh, the COVID came, uh, the, the, the indigenous movement in Ecuador actually managed to, to oust the government from uh, Quito, from the capital, uh, they had to go to Guayaquil, and the indigenous movement entered the parliament. You know, I have friends from the community where I work, who had you know, their own images uh, uh, taken from inside the <laughs> government palace, they entered. And uh, this process stopped because of the of the COVID crisis, and uh, we, we have to see uh, how how this will will develop. As for uh, you know uh, the protests in Peru, uh, the constitutional process uh, in Chile, etc. I also struggle to find you know common points and comparing this this uh, this process with what happened 20 years ago. I, I, I see mainly differences. I, I see I see signs of protests 20 years ago, focusing around you know neoliberal austerity policies, how to overturn them, this kind this kind of stuff. Uh, there was a there was direct contact uh, between uh, all these processes. You know, Venezuela was kind of in the middle. Hugo Chavez was there. Uh, Cuba was also assisting, and I don't see that. I don't really see that now, and. Uh, I hope that uh, we will uh, have a resurgence of, you know, the left and left-wing politics. Uh, but for the time being, I'm also struggling to, to find the common points. Thank you very much uh, also for uh, the questions. I want to close now. I just wanted to make a few points which I think could be relevant also for uh, other roundtables uh, in the future or for when uh, Santiago and Leo will be able to come to Florence in person. Uh, and I think this uh, element of uh, uh, the um, comparative perspective on Latin America is important. Uh, what we learn from the work, among others, of Ken Roberts, but also many Latin American, is, the, is that even uh, the other wave of uh, left-wing politics uh, were different in different countries. Uh, um, uh, sometimes they clustered around uh, uh, some model, but in reality, then when you look within each of these uh, model, being them the more institutional one uh, or the more revolutionary one, they they tended to be different. So I think. Uh, we need to wait and see uh, to understand uh, which are uh, uh, maybe different way towards a common, different path towards a, a similar type of uh, development and to which extent problems uh, were also uh, similar. So uh, I, I think that what we can say is that if compared with previous moments uh, of um, uh, um, crisis in Latin America. You are too young to remember the 70s directly, but I, I do, the 70s and the 80s. Uh, um, what we can see now is that the type of developments are uh, uh, much more peaceful to, to a large extent. So uh, the, the discussions we had also in the previous roundtable, but the cases that we have mentioned are cases of uh, electoral uh, um, uh, alternations in power after all. Coup d'etat that has been uh, blocked, 
a lot of repressions, but uh, uh, is not Chile of Argentina uh, of the dictatorship. And also in comparison with the years 2000s, it seems that there is more institutional uh, type of uh, uh, um, settlement settings. I think maybe one common challenge that I see uh, in the different uh, uh, cases, uh, uh, challenges to left-wing government uh, have been uh, uh, in the realm of uh, political economy. So the fact that uh, the first revival of the left was helped uh, by uh, the uh, general conditions that facilitated countries that were exporting uh, uh, raw materials. And this has also had the negative impact of pushing these countries towards more extractivism, but gave also resources, gave resources that were used in the fight against poverty, but also in something that Leo said, in, in the creation to a certain extent of a middle class that uh, uh, was also strengthened by this. Uh, and uh, I think it was when uh, that type of uh, global uh, uh, economy changed uh, with the crisis uh, of prices for several of these raw materials that uh, uh, governments in uh, Brazil as in other countries made the choice a choice that were perceived as uh, uh, excluding the middle class or excluding those who were inside so they kept uh, um, policies against poverty but uh, lost the capacity to include also uh, other groups. And uh, I think that's uh, the ways in which this type of challenges will be addressed will be uh, important also uh, nowadays. So just uh, on this, I want to thank you in particular because uh, um, I think that also you have helped us uh, understanding uh, a, a case uh, in that has been very little addressed by uh, the media, but also by scholars. So uh, especially now under the pandemics, the Bolivia elections went almost unnoticed uh, in the media, but also in the alternative media. And I think you have helped us uh, a lot in these uh, uh, directions. Just wanted also to uh, mention that this is the last of the Cosmos uh, Roundtable for the fall uh, term uh, of 2020, but in 2021, we would like to uh, uh, repeat this uh, experience and uh, invite all of you uh, to uh, um, uh, make suggestions about other roundtables that uh, could be interesting to organize. So thank you, Leo, thank you, uh, Santiago, and thank you Thanks to all of you and uh, uh, looking forward to the end of the pandemics and having you in Florence soon. We're looking forward to. Uh, I, I wrote it down. I, I recorded that, Donatella. So I, I, I hope <laughs> it's, recorded. Yeah, it, it's, it's recorded. Yeah, it's recorded. And, and I will see you in Florence next time. But thank you, thank you for the invitation. It was great seeing you, uh, Santiago, Donatella, Enrico, all the friends. Bye.